no worries. All right, I'm gonna share my screen now. All right, could you see a uh, PowerPoint? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah. All right. And and the question was three point two three, wasn't it? Uh, yes. Um. So let's take a look. And this company wish to hedge its exposure to a new fuel price zero point six correlation with gasoline futures price change. So that tells you this is going to be a cross hedge because it's not using um not using exactly the asset they want to hedge. It's going to be an imperfect hedge. Um, the company will lose $1 million for each one cent increase in the price per gallon and the new fuels price change standard deviation that is 50%. So uh, pretty much you're going to use this like very much standardized formula. Um, I'm going to use my version of, uh, of lecture notes because uh, I know Andrew just used the same, for, uh, same lecture notes. So I'm going to use my anyway. Um, and uh, you need to work out the hatch ratio is beta time. Sorry, just give me one second. Apologize for that. I mean, that, that's the inconvenience of sort of um, uh, do, doing a meeting at home. You can't pretend you're not there because um, people can hear, can hear you at the gate. Um, so over here, basically, you need to work out. Um, the, so the exposure is 100 million gallons of new fuel. And so in this case, you need to work out a hatch ratio, which is the, um, which is the correlation times uh, 1.5 because it's telling you the, the, the price change has standard deviation that is 50% greater, so which that makes the sigma, uh, where about the sigma, which is right. I mean, this that just means 1.5 times more than that. It's 50% more than that, right? Oops, 50% more than that. 50% yeah. greater than the price change. So which basically you need to work out, well, what is the, um, what is the uh, optimal number? So in this case, it's going to be, the beta times because he's saying the asset moves more than the futures asset move more than the futures right so which means that yep. it's going to be 50 percent more which is 1.5 if the question was saying is 50 percent less that will be just going to be 0 0.5 right um and that goes to 0 0.9 and they, they, they need to do that so which means that's going to be taking 90 million gallons of, of futures and because they have uh so, so if the, so they will lose $1 million for each one cent increase in the price per gallon. That tells you that the higher the price, the more they lose. That just means that currently they haven't got the fuel yet. They will need to buy in the future, so which means in order to hatch that, you can think of it that as they're taking a short position in the underlying asset at the moment, or you could just simply think of it that because they haven't got it yet, haven't bought it yet, in order to do some hedging, what do you do? You do you take long or do you take short? You, you would definitely take long because long allows you to buy an asset at a fixed price, right? Sorry, just give me one second. Sorry, just a lot of delivery this morning. <laughs> People just keep knocking at the door. There was nothing happening in the first 10 minutes and then and everyone came, it's sort of like from the, I mean, a delivery. Um, so that tells you that here, that tells you, first of all, we work out the numbers. And then, um, and so, and given that you need to take 90 million gallons of gas fuel and each one is 42,000 per futures contract, because usually one futures contract is linked to, um, it linked to certain numbers. But, but I think I talked about it in my tutorial, that's why I wanted to ask you, is that, this question doesn't really specify how many is in underlying. So which means that that, part, that, piece of, that piece of information over here is missing from the question, right? Yeah, yeah. that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah so which means that, I mean, I mean, typically, 
the question will supply that unless that's something that, that, that's like a standard knowledge. Like for example, what, what is the index point for each a, uh, ASX 500, ASX 200 index? But this is not a standard sort of conventional knowledge for people. So that's really just the missing part from the question. Um, can I also calculate that? Is it that the, uh, the size of the spot position is uh, 100 million gallons divided by the size of the future contract, which is uh, in this case, 42,000 gallons, then you times it by the H ratio and that will give you the answer. Yeah, well, I mean, like if you, wanted to, if you want to express the formula in one go, that's the formula is what, it, um, okay. is, yeah. But then, but then what you want to think about is that you want to think about, well, you, you want to think about is the 100 times the hash ratio first because you want to work out, I mean, in what proportion would you want to do? Because this futures contract per gallon, this futures contract of 42,000 gallons, that comes the second step because usually each futures contract would have, you know, different specification, right? Different um, one contract for X amount of units. That comes as a secondary issue. The first issue is to work out, given this is going to be imperfect hedge, right? How many do you have to do? So, which is why I, I wanted to think about like, uh, like in, in terms of working out that number first, 100 times 0 0.9 first, and then work out how many futures contracts do you actually need once you know the exposure. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, calculation-wise, they're all the same, right? So you can, everything happens in one go, but um, yeah, but that's the, um, that's, the, that's the one. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for tuning up. Um, we, do we have, I mean, feel free to utilize the, uh, the chat box over here. I'm monitoring that as well. Um, and feel free to put, putting any questions there saying, Frank, you want, you want to discuss X, X or Y, um, because otherwise I'm, I'm going to quickly go to a question that's sent from the email and I'm going to record that, uh, record my, my response to that. And some of you may actually think that is, that's worthwhile as well. Okay, let me stop sharing for a second so I can find out exactly what that question was from my email. All right, I'm gonna paste it. Here, so we can take a look at it. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, share screen. There we go. Um, so here's the question. Um, So this students uh, find option strategies difficult, especially when some spread needed K2 greater than K1, K1 greater than K2 for long, and not sure how to do this, and not sure has to be high and long core strike price, and how does it benefit us from bull and bear spread if we do this? Um, it's a payoff, while well, some payoff are this. Is that possible? Can you talk about the calculation of payoff? So basically, this is linked to your um, week nine material. Which is on, let me go, let me go to your lecture. Oops. There we go, in lecture materials. Uh, this is related to option trading strategies. Um, how many of you actually find that difficult? That part of the unit, option trading strategies, working out payoff profit. Ferris? Vanish, inching. Uh, I mean, you can use the calculator that was given. That yeah. Spreadsheet. You can use the calculator that's given, you mean an Excel spreadsheet? Yeah. Okay. Um, so how about Fook, Zoe, Seal, and Jalu? Yeah, I think it's still quite difficult, even okay. with the <laughs> Okay. Um, I mean, I mean, personally, I, I don't want, I mean, uh, I mean, I kind of, I mean, personally, I'm not in favor of using any given calculator or any, any provided uh, Excel spreadsheet because 
there could be many different trading strategies where um, I believe that's, that must be one of the, um, the calculator. Um, uh, I just feel like it's impo more important to understand what's happening over there. So let me see what I can find my tutorial questions. Oh, nice. Sync. Not this one. This one. Yeah, that's the one. Um, well, first of all, let me go through. I mean, I'm just gonna go through it. I mean, and especially for the student who's gonna listen to the recording, just for that question, I'm actually gonna go quickly go through the intuition behind this. Um, so basically, option trading strategy, I mean, why do we need to learn that? The reason why we're learning it is, is just simply telling you that we are able to really, I mean, for the wealth and trading strategy week one, we are able to incorporate our view on volatility into the portfolio construction. So previously, uh, I mean, the reason why we didn't learn about, for example, futures trading strategy is because future or we, we just futures contract Given futures contract is non-conditional payoff. And when I say non-conditional payoff, it just means that uh, every party, long or short, is obligated to, um, to, to deliver or to buy. So everyone is the same, right? But, it, but in the case of call or put option, now we have one party has the right, but not, not the obligation to do something. And that suddenly makes the game different because then we have a changing, I mean, like in, in, in a technical term, we have a non-linear payoff such that our payoff function is no longer a straight line like what I what I trying to draw over here. That's what I'm trying to explain in this tutorial, in my tutorial, that it used to be a straight line where where your your where your uh, your gradient, your slope is the same along all the payoff function, along every every bit of the function. But now with call and put option, given they have a non-linear payoff. For example, if you take a look at, this is the call option, right? Long call position. We know that the payoff is gonna be a flat line up until roughly where? Ferris, where's the turning point for long call option? Um, at the strike price. Exactly, right? At a strike price. Okay, here, that's where the turning point is because beyond that point, the long position sees an opportunity to get start getting positive payoff. But before that, if they exercise it, they will get a negative payoff like what they used to have for a long position in futures contract. If you're obligated to do it, you wouldn't want to buy at a higher price than the market, right? Because K tells you the price that you want to you want to pay for it. Um, with that feature, and then people people just went very sort of creative to think about okay. That's just like mathematically, that's just like, you know, a function where there's one part of it is flat. The other part, part of it goes up. And what if we combine a few of them? What would happen? Because if you think about just this, if you think about a long futures contract or a long position underlying asset, doesn't matter how many you combine. If you combine two of them, one long, one short, that becomes a flat line, right? Actually, that, let, let me utilize my, uh, my iPad. So... I'm gonna share, share. Um, share, iPad. Yeah, I need to install a new plugin. So every time, every time using this function, it asks me to uh, upgrade a new plugin. So it's gonna take a while. Okay, done. All right, could you see a blank screen? Spin it two two oh four. Yes, can you see my see my writing? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So if you think about if we combine a long position in asset and a short position in asset, I mean a long position in asset is just like this, right? And the short positioning asset is just like this. Actually, um, let's just be precise at the same point, right? You can think of it that that turning point is where your original purchase price 
such that kind of like a break even point would be selling back you know at the original price so if you do that you feel like oh that's pointless why would anyone want to do that because that just cancel out cancel out uh, perfectly so that's why we don't that's why we don't we don't learn this right um if you think about if i'm buying two how about in the case where i buy two long asset well given that two long asset originally the slope was 45 degrees you just make it steeper and again, that, that, that's nothing interesting. I mean, why do we need to learn about buying two, two long assets? People just know that if you get paid $10 per asset, you're going to get paid $20 per asset. If you lose $10 per asset, you're going to lose $20 per asset. So that's not fun, right? That's why we didn't learn it. But now with, now with options, call and put options, and in particular, four positions, because you have long Call, short call, long put, and short put. So now we have many different combination and spread. Uh, so um, some of you may, 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 may recall that. What's the difference between spread and combination? What's the difference between spread and combination? Anyone? <laughs> Kevin. Yeah. You know, Kevin. Yeah. Did you did, did you recall from our tutorial what was the difference between spread and combination? Spread only uses either calls or books. Yeah. Combination. And combination will use multiple type types of options, right? So which means you combine with uh, coin put. So one type, not saying one, one, one position, but one type and two types. And so once, I mean, and then you, and then you can have as many sort of like uh, spread and combination possible. Doesn't matter what you, doesn't matter what you create, you can name it, but as long as you know what you're doing and then that's it. So, um, let's just go to uh, go back over here. Go back to the um, to the lecture note, such that we can take a look. Um, take a look at, at one example. Teachings. Uh, let me just use my old lecture note. There we go. So, so for example, uh, I mean, the question people, um, the student asked me was that uh, want to do, for example, if you are doing a bull spread using call option. So a bull spread tells you it's going to be using one type of options. If you can create a bull spread with calls, you can create a bull spread with puts. But now let's first investigate how do you do a bull spread using calls. So a bull spread here. By definition, I mean, again, we can do, you can do whatever you want, but this is what people do and they call this bull spread, right? So bull spread here, we have long a call option at a low strike price and short a call option at a higher strike price. And they both have the same underlying asset, both have the same expiration date, right? Um, and given that, given that in this case, the higher the strike price, the higher the call premium or the lower the call premium? What's the relationship between the call premium and strike price? Negative, right? Because call option give you the, give you the right but not the obligation to buy something. So that means holding everything else constant, the higher the K, that means the higher the price you have to purchase the underlying asset. So which means that that becomes least favorable uh, you know, uh, to you, which means in this case, this one costs more than that. So which is why you're saying you require an initial investment because it costs you more than, um, it costs you more to long, this, long that one than that one. And I mean, and then why does that matter? Well, it matters, it tells you that, well, if no option is exercised, 
is say if none of the option is exercised, none of the option is exercised, are you going to walk away with a negative payoff or a positive payoff? If none of the options are exercised. Okay, I mean, let me utilize my iPad again. Such that we can, I mean, you, you have the graph in front of you. So it's kind of like, kind of pointless to think about, um, but you know, you're looking at a graph. All right, so let's, let's, let's deal with, deal with this. So first example, bull spread using cause. So in this case, our definition is not because why do we do this? It's, it's a definition. We, I mean, we call this bull spread if we long a call at K1 and short a call at K2 and K1 is less than K2. This is the definition. If K1 is greater than K2, that would be a bad spread, right? That, that wouldn't be a bull spread. We're not going to call it a bull spread. But in this case, if we are dealing with bull spread, that's what we do. So in this case, um, uh, I would like in, in, you to encourage, uh, to think, think of this. Think about drawing a straight line first. Drawing a straight line, in this case, we have two uh, price points to discuss, right? K1 and K2. So in this case, let's just say, if we're looking at a normal option, let's say just one core option and with strike price K, if you draw a line and it's one uh, price point, if it's one price point, we have two range to talk about, which is ST less than K or ST greater than K, right? We have two ranges to talk about, this part and this part. And now given we have two, uh, two price points in this case, then that makes, there will be three segments to talk about. Where does three segment come from? Come from ST less than K1, K1 less than ST, less than K2, and ST greater than K2. I mean, greater or equal, or equal doesn't really matter, right? So in this case, we have three scenarios to think about. And based on this line, what, we can, what, I, what I can do here is think about, well, what do I do? I long a call at K1 and I short a call at K2. Knowing, remember, just K1 is smaller than K2, right? We, we name it K1 and K2. We index it for that reason. So if you long a, K, a call at K1, then at maturity, at maturity, you have six, three scenarios, right? And just draw the scenarios. So if ST is less than K1, are you going to buy something at a price that's higher than the market price? Are you gonna buy it? Are you gonna buy a K1 when the spot price you can buy from the market is actually cheaper? Would you do that? No. That, exactly, right? So that, that's, that's zero. And given K1 is less than K2, that, that also means zero over here because you're not going to do that, right? Long position, long position in that contract is not going to do it. Long position in that contract is not going to do it. So which means it's going to be zero for the short position as well because it's zero sum game, right? And between K1 and ST and K2 in this middle range, given now the spot price and maturity is greater than K1, which means you can buy it at a lower price. Would you do it? Yes, you will. For long position. And for short position with the strike price K2, again, you're not going to do it. I mean, the long party is not going to do it such that short party, which is going to say, let's just, you know, uh, we, can, we can rest another day, right? And given K1 is smaller than K2, when, when ST is greater than K2, would you exercise it? Yes, you will exercise it as a long position. But however, for short position in core, well, the long position is gonna, gonna exercise it because then they can buy it at a price at K2, which is lower than the market price. So they will do it, right? Just actually, let me correct that one, that's K1, 
right? Because that's dry price K1. So in this case, long party will receive ST minus K2, but you are the short position. You are the opposite of that, right? So you write the long first, bracket short. So overall, I get zero, I get ST minus K1, and what do I have at the end? ST minus ST cancels out. Minus K1 minus minus K2, that becomes K2 minus K1. And what do I know about that number? This is positive, isn't it? Because K2 is greater than K1. And given that initially, so this is payoff. This is payoffs. And then we worry about profit. So profit, given that initially, it costs us to, to enter in this contract. Why, do, why does it cost us? Because the core premium at K1 is greater than the core premium at K2 because core and strike price have a negative relationship, right? Have a negative relationship. The higher the strike price, the lower the premium for core option because essentially core option is buying something for K to list, right? So knowing that, that means initially we're gonna pay more, pay more and receive less from writing that option such that I know that initially this is gonna be a zero minus a value, right? A core option value. I just say VE value, but it could be, I don't know, it's just core. C1 uh, minus C2, right? Zero minus C1, because basically you, you know that this is, a, this is gonna be an active number, right? An active number. That's more important because I, I, we haven't given you a number yet, but in a question, it may tell you $3, it's gonna be $3 uh, premium for K1 and then $2 premium for K2. Then you, with that number, you can work out exactly that. And again, for the payoff of this middle range, it's gonna be ST minus K1 minus this negative value, right? Because it's gonna be a negative premium. And over here is gonna be K2 minus K1 minus negative value. So with that, knowing that this is our, uh, it's gonna be our profit diagram, just draw it, K1, K2, below K1 is gonna be a negative value. Above K1 is going to be ST minus K1. And then, ab and then above it is going to be K2 minus K1. And, and roughly, that's what a diagram is. So unless we have specific numbers, otherwise the diagram could, could, could be just left like that. All right? Um, and given the student who asked this question is not here, I just, I will presume that this is, this is it. <laughs> um, and then really, the, the, I mean, the question could go a bit more complicated by looking at butterfly spread, by looking at, um, you know, different other combinations. But in a nutshell, you're all summarizing this because of like one slide where you need to think about the payoff at various different scenarios. And how do you know what kind of scenarios you have to worry about? Well, the scenarios over here is determined by how many strike prices available. If there's one strike price, one strike price, you need to consider two scenarios over here, two strike prices, three scenarios. And for butterfly spread, that we just elaborate a little bit. So for butterfly spread, You long K1, uh, if it's core or put, doesn't matter. Long K3, short K2, but it's two times short K2, right? In overall, you've got four options. In this case, with this kind of uh, spread, you have K1, K2, and K3. So naturally, given those three break, break points, you will be worrying about three scenarios over here, over here, over uh, four scenarios is what I'm trying to say. ST less than K1 and then K1 less than ST less than K2, and then K2 less than ST less than K3. 
and then SD greater than K3, right? And then, you, and then you just think about what is your payoff, right? What is the payoff in each condition? And then combine them. And then that will help you to draw, to, to give you a rough idea about what a, what a diagram looks like. And then with the, uh, and then with the uh, exact numbers, you can then work out what that number is over here. For example, what is the, what is the intercept over here, right? Okay. Um, sorry, can I just ask what if there are like different exercise dates? Like, I think there's one question. That's, that's, the, the, that's the calendar spread. Okay, oh, we can talk about that. Let me just move to that tutorial question over here. And, and that's actually quite an interesting one because with, with, with those one, you're not gonna be able to draw the precise, the exact figures, but it's important for you to get a sense of what that figure would roughly look like, right? Um, Let me go to my screen. Okay, so uh, I think eleven point two zero is one of one of those questions, and in, in this case, it's actually a slightly more difficult than the one I'm looking at uh, providing a uh, lecture notes, Canada spread. So this one is doing with diagonal spread. So diagonal spread again is using spread. That means that you know it's going to be single options. Uh, you could have a diagonal combination, but that's just going to be even more complicated, right? That could be what beyond, but then I don't know. Um, so over here, a diagonal spread is created by buying a core option with strike price K2, SI state T2, and selling a core option with strike price K1 and SI T1. So draw diagram show the profit when K2 greater than K1 and K2 smaller than K1. So in this case, we need to think about how many scenarios we, do we have? So, well, we're going to short the core at K1. That's what we told with the exercise T1. And, and I'm gonna long a core option at K2, at T2. All we know here is that T2 is greater than T1, but we don't know anything about the relationship between K1 and K2 such that we have to make our own assumption. So unlike, you know, unlike a, uh, uh, you know, unlike a boost spread where you told K1 is less than K2, right? Um, in, in this case, we're not sure. So which means I need to do a scenario analysis. So, okay, first of all, uh, the reason why I chose that in my, uh, in my tutorial as an explanation, it's because I feel like uh, K2 smaller than K1 is a clearer relationship. We start with a simple one. Given K2 is less than K1, right? And we know that the higher the strike price, the lower the core premium, right? The higher the strike price, the lower the core premium. And also, we have that roughly, even though uh, for European options, even though the exact relationship between time and core option premium is not exact, is not like either positive or negative, but we could say that for a, for a very incremental smaller increase in time to maturity, it means that you're going to get extra protection, right? Um, but of course, that's only, only hold marginally, right? Because the time, uh, the increasing time could be forever, could be like um, unlimited. So we can't say that relationship for sure. For, uh, for American options, we know that for sure. But for, sure, for European options, we know that for just for very incremental, smaller change, the increase in the time to maturity would mean that the core option premium increases. Okay. So knowing that, given the higher the strike price, the lower the core premium, that means, in this case, assuming the strike price K2 is smaller than K1, what do we have? That means that the core premium for K2 is going to be greater than the core premium for K1. And also, T2 is longer than T1. And that means the core premium for K2 is greater than the core premium for K1. So combining that, given that the both relationship of strike price and the time to maturity leads to the same direction. And that can take us to say, well, in this case, is there not going to be initially a cash inflow or outflow? Cash inflow or outflow? 
Exactly, right? Because you're long call at K2, such that you know that if your option remains unexercised, you're going to hit a negative payoff, right? Because if, 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 because if everything is unexercised, nothing is exercised, then you pretty much walk away with what you originally have. And why is that important? Because that tells us roughly where the intercept is, right? It tells us in this case, uh, which scenario would that be? So that is the, um, S eleven point four. Okay, this is um, this is the this is the scenario we just talked about, and that tells you the intercept over here when nothing is exercised is negative. So which means that if you if I'm um, in your head, if you think about which diagram you're gonna draw, roughly it's gonna be the top one, because if the option remains unexercised, it's gonna be walking away with a negative payoff because originally you're paying more to acquire K two than what you receive from K1, right? And then the rest over here is kind of like straightforward in the case that, because you know that um, like by the time you exercise T1, remember the T1 is gonna be the first that it's gonna be exercised, right? Because T1 is greater than, as T1 is smaller than T2. So at a time where T1 is gonna be, a T1 option is gonna be exercised, which is K1, and what do you do that? Is short call option. So which means your diagram is gonna be looking like this, where you're gonna have a dashed line like this, because that represents the short call option, right? Represent a short call option. So let me share my screen again. So in this case, the scenario we're dealing with is the first one where K2 is less than K1. If K2 is less than K1, then we are saying short call at K1 is cheaper than long call we're saying cheaper is like the absolute value of, of course one of them is positive one of them is negative but we're saying we're saying the, the absolute value so what we're doing over here is that um k2 that's all combining that so roughly if nothing is exercised if nothing is exercised then we know that roughly we're going to get a negative payoff And it has to be a turning point somewhere, right? Where's that turning point? That turning point is where the option will be exercised. Why? It's because I know that for the short call at K1, it's not gonna be exercised until K1. And once the, strike, once the stock price and maturity T1 is greater than K1, I know that's gonna be exercised. And that tells me, well, that's pretty much like all, all you need to know. Where for the other one, it's gonna be just like sloping upward. Because that's one, it's just, just talking about the time value plus the intrinsic value of the other option at K2, right? And, but it's important for you to get, why is that here, right? Why is that initially there's negative payoff, right? Does that make sense? So far? Yes. Okay, all right. Because I, yeah, because as I said before, I can't see what you guys are doing. Maybe you're not even watching. So I can't really tell whether I should just keep keep going on and, and uh, or I should stop and, and explain it again. But, uh, you know, as the, the important bit over here is that you cannot draw a precise diagram. 
That's the problem with this kind of questions because we don't know how far off T2 is from T1. And we don't know how K2 is far off from K2 from K1. We, we all we're given it here just roughly. There is a relationship. That's why our graph here is just roughly looking like that. But remember, this is a curve, right? They're all curved because for long core option uh, at K2, it's going to be upward sloping line, right? Upward sloping line. All right, now let's look at a different scenario where, I mean, uh, let's just switch back to my screen again. So we can look at my derivation there together. So having examined the easier scenario, let's move on to the slightly harder one. Uh, the reason why it's slightly harder because we get a conflicting result. So let's just say over here, um, if strike price two is greater than strike price one, then what we have here is that, well, we know that from time to maturity, the relationship is such that CK2 is greater than CK1. But if K2 is greater than K1, we know that the CK2 is smaller than CK1. So which means in this case, we have to make an assumption, right? We have to make an assumption and the assumption is here. So, which means we need to, we, we, we need to take we need to take take terms over here. Um, so, if the impact coming from strike price is greater than the impact from time to maturity, then what we have here is that the short position is worth more than long position. So, this is where the strike price, because you are actually short the K one. And if K1 is smaller than K2, that means you're gonna get a higher premium than you paying to, to acquire K2. So in this case, initially, you will receive, or not initially, because but but initially you will receive a high premium. And if nothing's exercised, you're gonna walk away with a positive premium. That's what that red line is trying to show you over here, is that if nothing is exercised, you're going to be, so it, it means the payoff on both core options are going to be zero. You're going to be walk away with your initial payoff, which is a positive amount. Why? Because we assume that K1 less than K2 and this, and this effect from strike price is greater than the effect from time to maturity, such that initially I have, I receive a positive amount. And that explains why it's here, not below there, right? And then what's next here is that, well, just like usual, I'm gonna slope upwards until I'm gonna slope, slope down, right? And where's the turning point? The turning point is where the short position gonna be exercised. So re remember T1 is less than T2. And over here, given that K1 is here, K1 is smaller than K2. So different from that scenario, right? K1 is smaller than K2. That means the turning point comes a lot before than before. So that is just going to be going that and down. Where in the other scenario where long position was more than short position, that means initially you will have a negative payoff. And if nothing's exercised, you're going to be walking away with negative payoff. And that means you're going to be sloping upwards, sloping upwards, but coming from a negative point, where in this case coming from a positive point, sloping upwards to the peak and then the turning point coming from where the short position starting to be exercised, right? And, and those three features are what you need to, to display. I, I don't know how you're gonna do that in your exam, but I'm just saying, if that was a written exam, those three points are where I can, I can tell whether you understand or not. First of all, if nothing's exercised, is it gonna be a negative or positive pill? And can you show roughly at where the strike price are? K1, K2, K1 here, K or K1 there. And the third one is that, do you know, is that gonna be up, uh, upward sloping and then downward sloping or downward sloping and then upward sloping? And if so, at where's the turning point, all right? So that's why, you know, in, in all my diagrams over here, I'm trying, trying to show you that this is where you want to indicating you have a clear understanding of what's going on, right? So if you're comparing that one and that one, it looks roughly the same except where that one knows nothing exercise, you walk away with positive payoff, nothing exercise, you walk away with a negative payoff, right? 
Does it answer your question, Vinish? Vinish? Yep, it does. Thank you. That's perfect. Um, yeah, but I do want to say that this is kind of difficult, right? Um, because the, I mean, the reason why it's difficult because it all of that is not is not precise, right? We, and we can't draw a precise diagram because we don't know we don't know the uh, the, the you know the pair of di uh, the pair of diagram for K two at time t one, right? We don't know that because it's still early yet. They haven't been exercised, and it's a European object. So we, all we can say here is that it's going to be an upward sloping curve if it's long position. Or downward sloping curve if it's a short position. Downward sloping, not a straight line, but downward sloping. All right. Um, I have a question. Uh, so, why does the the pair of diagram for K two start from the negative value? Uh, for which one For which diagram? If you can see it, it's code number eleven point two, eleven point three, or eleven point four. Yeah, but I think I think for all like the pair of diagram for um, the K two options. They all start from the negative value, like yeah. Oh, because you have to pay for it. It's because this is one. This one is you long it, right? Remember how you long call option, which is why that 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 upward sloping curve always starting, not starting, but it's just saying if you don't exercise it, and if you're not gonna exercise it at T two as well, you're just gonna walk away with an active payoff because initially you pay a premium. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And same thing goes over here, right? Uh, if nothing's exercised, you're gonna walk away with a positive payoff from K1, from the K1 option. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No worries. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, let me check the chat box, see whether anyone type anything over there. Okay, not so far. Okay, it's all right. I'm just browsing my own notes, and sometimes I don't even know what I what 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 I'm trying to say there. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? I mean, given that we are in option strategies, do, is there any other questions related to option strategies? Anything that I don't understand from here, for example? Take a look. Are the no. trips and traps gonna be covered in the exam? Sorry, what was that? A uh, strip and trap? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, I won't say no. I mean, given that's what was already covered in your lecture notes, I, I I presume so. Okay. I mean, I, I really tend tend not to worry too much about what will be covered, um, and. And, and, and you know, I'm, I mean, this is a really unofficial, but uh, but I do want to do want to say that that um, you know how I, the other day I I constructed this for you guys because I'm uh, some of you may know that I'm not your unicorn aid, right? I'm only just a tutor that, but I used to teach this unit, and I'm really just trying to help help some of you out that I've got the students got this uh, question from students saying what does the final exam look like? And I say I have no, I have no idea. I don't know what that looks like because uh, I'm because I'm not in charge of that. Um, so, and so I look. I took a look at the version of the question that I was given, and I and then I made I made this uh, coverage, and I get the lady Anna to to publish online, and then we look at there's a beyond section, which is kind of surprising me, and so um, uh, like another lecturer of this unit, not uh, not not Andrew because Andrew already uh, resigned. Um, and we decided to maybe help you make it more reasonable. Um, but I'm, but, but yeah, as I said before, I'm not your, like, like even today, I'm still not your unicorn editor. I'm not a lecturer. So I don't actually know what your latest version of the exam look like. But I guess the purpose is trying to make it reasonable because I don't think, personally, I don't think it's, 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 um, it's fair to ask beyond question, right? Personally, I don't think it's fair to ask that. Uh, so, there will be better improvement. So, um, yeah, but I'm giving you exams tomorrow. And I, don't, I don't know what, what I just said would, would help you in any way, but, but I think that, it's, that, that could only be better news than, than negative news, right? Um, when I was looking at that, you know, that breakdown, I was like, I was be shocked. 
Um, yeah. So there's not going to be any swap or. I mean, I can't, I can't say that at, at, at this stage, but, you know, I guess the purpose is that given this is already published, because I, I you know, I just told you guys this. Uh, so which means that we can't throw you any more surprises. So which means we're trying to stick to this as much as possible, but make the exam more reasonable such that we're not going to have beyond section. Oh, okay. If that makes sense, because beyond is something that is not, you guys have never seen this. Yeah, you just you have never seen your unit. You just have to imagine how to do it. <laughs> you just have to be creative about how to do it. I, which I think that's kind of unnecessary. But um, yeah, but I don't know, right? Um, because I'm not told yet. Also, oh, they may replace the beyond section. Yeah, with exactly, the, exactly. With something may, from the from what you have learned, right? So I, I yeah. guess don't 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 stick with this too much in the sense that. He's saying, oh, if, if it's week six is not covered, does that mean I don't have to review it? You guys have learned it, right? You basically, I mean, here is the preference. Do you want to be examined something that you have taught? Or do you want to be examined something that you've never taught? <laughs> so, so here is the trade-off, right? Um, so oh. I guess that, that's the message I, I was trying to, trying to tell. Yeah, I, I don't think it's fair to ask anyone, any, anyone that is a beyond question. That's something that is like you guys just have not seen before. Oh, okay. All right. Any other questions regarding um, any weeks? Any week? I mean, your your the previous version of the exam is just right here. <laughs> it's just a few clicks away. Uh, but I don't. I mean, is is a bit un unfortunate. The exam wasn't perfect. All right, any questions? Um, can you go through, uh, I think one of the questions in tutorial A is about identifying the arbitrage strategy. Okay, take a look. Uh, eight. And do you know what question number that is? Uh, it's 11 something. 10.11? Oh, yeah, yeah, 10.11. Okay. All right, um, perfect. So in this case, you are dealing with, um, so over here, what you're given is that a four-month European co-option, dividend paying stock, stock price, strike price, dividend, and the risk free rate. So in this case, given that you are not provided with, with uh, put option price, that means here we're dealing with an arbitrage opportunity for either a lower bound or upper bound. Because we're not provided with put option, we can't use put or parity. That's the first thing you want to arrive. Like as soon as you see this, it's saying, okay, all I'm given is just one type of option and I have nothing else, right? And here the stock price is 64. The premium is $5. That means you're not going to be looking at the upper bound. Why? Because the upper bound is core option premium cannot be greater than the, than the stock price at the moment. Because kind of, it kind of makes sense, right? Because oh, option give you the right but not obligation to buy the underlying asset. Why do you want to pay more than the asset to acquire such right? So which means in this case, we're not dealing, dealing with uh, upper, upper boundary. That means we're dealing with the lower boundary. And what's the lower boundary? The lower boundary is this. Stock price today, minus price value of dividends, minus KU minus RT, or zero. All right, so yeah. what exactly you need to do over here is to think of it, okay, um, put all the numbers in. You get a lower boundary to be 5.56. And, and then your option here is $5. That means there's, there's a bit of mispricing here. And how do you work out wh wh which way to go? Lower boundary tells you that Co-option should be at least $5.56. Should be at least $5.56. That means if it's lower than that, is that too cheap or too expensive? Too cheap? Exactly. So if it's too cheap, how would you exploit the arbitrage profit? Are you going to buy the too cheap one or to sell the too cheap one? You're going to buy the cheap one? Exactly. You want to buy the cheap one. So which means in this case, I'm going to buy a co-option, right? Buy a co-option and 
Well, and but how do I actually work that out? So this is one way. Again, I mean, it's, it's open book. You can use these notes if you want. Um, it's the simplest way. Is to think of it is that well, given my co-option premium is smaller than that, right? Smaller than that. That means S zero minus PVD minus K minus RT minus C is going to be greater than zero. So skip this, skip this middle step. Like right? you don't you pretend you don't, you don't see it, right? You can just you can just move that one to the right hand side, right? So that means S zero minus PVD minus K minus RT minus C is greater than zero, right? Greater than zero. And this is what you're trying to achieve. And how do you do it? Well, just, just think of it. What does minus C represent? Minus C represent is a cash outflow from you. That's worth C. In what scenario would that happen? That means I'm going to buy a core option, right? Yeah. And plus S0, what does plus S0 means? Plus S0 means I receive an amount that is equal to S0 or I receive S0 plus S0, right? So that means here, I'll be short an asset. And minus PVD, you know, always include a sign in the front. Minus PVD means it's going to be a cash outflow. Minus, minus K minus RT is going to be cash outflow. So when there's a cash outflow, that means I'm trying to invest. I'm going to invest that amount. So, okay. And then knowing that, moving to this window, to this table over here. I'm going to sell a, so I'm going to buy a call option that's minus C plus S0, I'm going to short a stock. Minus PVD means I'm going to invest or lend the present value of, div of dividend. Minus K minus RT means I'm going to invest or lend present value of, of strike price. Right. It's present value, right? Present value of strike price. But the trick here in this question is that given this stock is paying dividend, we need to know that there's an extra time point for us to consider. And a time point here is at time T where a dividend is paid, right? So when you're short selling a stock at time zero, you're going to receive what? You're going to receive the current stock spot price of the stock price, which is 64, right? 64 here. Buy the call option, cost you five dollars. Lend the present value of dividends is zero point seven nine as what as as this term over here is zero point seven nine. And then lend present value of strike price is fifty seven point six five. That's fifty seven point six five over here, right? That 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 part. All right. Okay. So at the start, yeah, you go hook. Yeah. Okay. Then, uh... Just go ahead. Yeah. All right. So at at, at time zero, we walked out. We walked out. Walk, walk, we walk out that time zero. The, the total payoff is zero point five six. So notice that this is a positive amount. Okay. And then we we'll move on at time smaller t. So t here refers to the first dividend date. Oh, in this case, there's only two one dividend. So let's just make it slightly easier, but complicated, slightly complicated than the normal case. So at time t one, because you short sell a stock. That means you owe someone a stock. Or you can think of it is that you're currently holding a stock that is originally owned by someone else. And if the stock pays out dividends, do you get paid dividends? Yes, you get paid dividends because you're holding it. But you need to transfer that dividends back to the original owner because you don't actually own that share, right? So which means in this case, if there's an 80 cents dividend paid, a short position in the stock will require to pay that 80 cents back to the original owner because you need to compensate the owner as if they don't lose their asset, right? So that means that if they are holding the share, they get paid dividends, they will receive dividends. And that means if you borrow a share from them, if they need to receive dividends, you have to pay them dividends, which that explains why there's a minus 0 0.8 over there. And that explains why do we lend present value of dividends for time small t is because we need to invest that in a risk-free account such that they will grow to 0 0.8, such that that will cover our future liability at time t, and such that at time t, the overall payoff is going to be zero, right? 
And then we move on. At time big T and maturity, given this is the core option, we have one price point and means two scenarios to worry about. The first one is the spot price lower than the strike price. And the second one is the spot price higher than the strike price. And when you short sell a stock, that means I have to pay someone back the stock. So which means in this case, regardless, that's going to be minus ST and minus ST. Regardless, that's unconditional, right? That's just going to be there. And if you buy a call option, would you exercise the option to buy at $60 when you can buy at a cheaper price than 60? The answer is no, right? You're not going to buy the call option, which means that, sorry, you're not going to exercise your call option, which means the payoff is going to be zero. But you will exercise the call option if spot price is greater than 60, ST minus 60, right? Over here. And that land of dividend dividend, that's, that's gone because that's, that happens at the terminus at time small t. And when you land present value of K, you will get back K at the end, which is 60 and 60 regardless. Now let's take a look, combine. So for the first scenario, we have 60 minus ST. What can we say about this number? This number is positive because that's in the scenario where ST is smaller than 60. In the second scenario, minus ST and ST cancels out. Minus 60 and 60 cancels out, we get zero. So now let's take a look. Given initially you have a positive cash flow, in all the subsequent time points, is there any negative cash flows? No, because it's zero. No. Positive or zero. And this is what we call an arbitrage profit. Because an arbitrage opportunity is one that it doesn't cost you anything. Of course, if, if you get anything, something back, that's, that's even better. It doesn't cost you anything, but there, there is no chance for it to result in a negative cash flow in the future, in all possible scenarios. That's what an object profit is. So you don't make a lo loss at the start, and there is no way for you to run into a next cash flow in any scenarios in the future, right? And, that, and this one ticks the box because you walk away with a positive amount, and no negative amount in the future. And that's how you, you know, implement the, the um, uptrack strategy. Yeah. All right. So let me get, get rid of this. Yeah, I just have questions on this step. Why do you have to um, make the sign a greater sign? Which one? This one? As one of the first thing, uh, when you, this one? After you got the lower bound, yeah, what do you have to like reverse it? No, no, you don't reverse it. Basically, I mean, it, I mean, I, this is what the answer rolls. You don't have to write this step. Basically, it's, it's, it's just that what we observe is that C is less than the lower bound, uh, lower bound, right? Because C is supposed to be greater than that, right? But if C is lower than that, that means S0 minus PVD minus K minus RT minus C is greater than zero. This one is just like some people, some people, I don't know what, some people's preference of thinking. They just say, okay, C is on the left hand side. I move everything to the left hand side. And then I just multiply by minus one to, to, to such that it's going to be greater than zero because it's important for you to work out greater than zero because that tells you it's going to be an upturn profit. If you do this, you're going to result in an upturn loss because if you do everything opposite, you're going to run into an opposite scenario because remember, this is a zero sum game, right? So I guess that's what, this, that's what the logic behind of doing this, just like moving that to the left hand side. But if you could listen to me, then trust me on one end is that that part is unnecessary. It's just like, you just go straight to that. You just say S zero minus PVD minus K minus RT minus C greater than zero. That's it. Yeah. Okay. You don't, you don't need to do that. I, I don't know why. I, I don't know why. But reading that, it's just saying maybe some people rearrange the formula in such way as their own preference, right? They, they want to move this first and then do that. <laughs> it's the same as just moving that directly, okay? Yeah, because in the five-step procedure in the lecture now, they also say rearrange the equation and then you have to yeah. make it a greater sign. <laughs> you don't, you don't need to. Oh. Just need to understand it. Okay. Yeah, right. right. Thank you. No worries.
All right, I'm just gonna go wait for me for uh, more questions from the floor. Any No questions? Just, if, if, do you want me to talk about anything? <laughs> While you think of, think of any questions? Um, can you go through um, problem five in week 10? Week like 10. the lecture, the slide. Uh, uh, in the lecture slide? Yeah, in the lecture slide. I, I don't actually know that. So let's let's go over here to the LMS. I need to think, I need to look, take a look at what question that is, because <laughs> you may or may not be the same question as what, as what I have. Oops, not one, just one. Is 2204. Uh, week 10 as in pricing uh, of binomial model? Yeah, binomial model. And question five is... Yeah, problem five. Is this. Okay. And yes, your, but early exercise of American options. Yeah. And your question is... Yeah, would would a dividend like? I'm not sure about the step to derive at the, like how to calculate the value of the, the value of the options with the dividend. Okay, um, this one is similar to 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 that question where there's a cash dividend, so um. Um, if you, so this is, this is very much the same with 18.11. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether I, uh, you know, um, because, uh, where about I was, because this one can, can be, can be easily solved using the Excel spreadsheet, the, the provider Excel spreadsheet, because if you are given that, it's just a click away, right? Um, but it's important to understand how that is performed. Um, so first of all, if you look at it, is that you have, uh, what's time to maturity? Five months. And if it's five step, the reason why it's chosen is to be five step, five period. That means each period is roughly a month. One, two, three, four, five, five months, right? Um, and, and then, so, what, so let's just using your tutorial one as the one that, as the easier one for you, for you to think of how that can be done. So, yeah. Over here, you are provided that in this particular question, which is now using call, but that's the same as pool. It just changed the payoff function. Um, we have three step tree, three months. Again, that means each step is roughly one month. And over here, 
the process to do is that, first of all, you work out the present value of dividends, right? Given that dividends going to be paid, $2 going to be paid at time 1.5, work out that present value of $2 today. So which means that's going to be e power to um, uh, 0 0.03 times 1.5 out of 12 uh, times $2, $2, which is that, right? You get 1.9925. And why does that matter? Well, that means I need to subtract my initial stock price from that. So my initial stock price is 20. That means now my, my artificial initial stock price is 18.0075. And then after that, you're just gonna use the calculated UND, UND, right? In this case, it tells you what UND is because it tells you the volatility is 25%, use the formula, you can work out what UND is. And then that means in this case, using 18.0075 as a starting point, calculate UND and build your tree in, in that way. And once you've done it, you add back the, uh, you add back the price value of dividends. And, but here's the key, right? Here's the key your initial price is going to be back to 20. That's for sure. But given your dividends paid in 1.5 months time, when you add back the dividends to your price point at, at that point, and at that point, that's going to be 0 0.5 months away. So which means here, this number is not 19.35 plus 1.9925. That's 19.35 plus present value of dividend in about 0 0.5 months away. So that will be which is right over here. Yeah, so that's what I want. That's what I, I wonder. Like why in the European option case, we just add back the dividend um, to the like the S0, the current stock price. We don't have to add it like at every stay, at every note, but then for American options, we have to add back the present value of dividend at every note. Uh, not every note, it's only the notes that is, um, let me just finish writing that. It's, it's only adding the note back at the price point before that, which means here, given the dividend is gonna be paid in 1.5 months time. So this is one month, this is two months, three months. So that dividend will be paid here, right? Yeah. That's roughly where the dividend is going to be paid. So which means we're only going to add back dividends before that, not after that. Because after that, it's not, not going to be any impact to, to the stock price. And so here's an end. And you may wonder, why do we do this approach? right? Why do we say yeah. you need to grow that? Uh, so, so I highly encourage you to go to discussion board. Uh, this is 2201. Yeah, to go for, sorry. And where about that question? Yeah, I think it's that one. About binomial model on dividend paying stock. Let me check whether that, that, that is the one. So I, I made some explanation over here, which I'm gonna, I can explain to you again. But just in case, if you wonder, oh, I think it's actually in my tutorial. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> it's actually in my... Um... That's Andrew's like, no. Uh, it's in my... I mean, there are a few ways for you to access that part of information. Uh, that's one way to go to the discussion thread, or you can just go to my uh, personal website. It's frankly.info slash finet204. If you go over there, if you go to the binomial option pricing model tutorial solution, click that one. Uh, I can't click it because I don't have my VPN on, but you should be able to click it. You go over there and it will take you to this PDF, which is what I uploaded. And in that PDF, I include an extra bit 
towards the end saying, which is the question asked by that student saying they, they don't understand why, you do, why you're doing it, right? And I, I, made, I made an explanation about why you're doing it. And let's and just quickly take a look at this together. So first of all, we need to know how we actually do it. How, what's the proper way of doing it? The proper way of doing it is what, is what we just described, right? But here's an alternative. Here's an alternative. The alternative is that we're gonna start with S0, which is whatever number, 20, 100, 50, and only change the stock price and NOS after the dividend payment to reflect a dividend has been paid. So which means we're gonna grow the tree like that, and we're gonna subtract the dividend price after the dividend is paid, right? That's, a, that's also one possibility because when dividend is paid, the share price drops, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. And um, so, but the reason why we pick this first one, which is what we do over here, why we pick this first approach is because for the second approach, the tree won't recombine. And what we mean by that is let's say, let's just look at this. Say here we have a normal tree, right? Two-step tree, normal, normal tree, no dividends. So let's say we start with 100, then we go to 100 U, 100 D, and then up 100 U squared, or 100 U D, or 100 D U, and 100 D squared, right? We understand that. But at the middle step, there are really, there are four scenarios, isn't it? But the reason why it's three scenarios is because 100 times U D is the same as 100 times D U, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's just say, if that's our understanding, and let's just say here, imagine a dividend is just is paid over here. Imagine after the first period, there's a dividend paid, sorry, between, so I have the example here is two months and a dividend is gonna be paid in 0 0.5 months time. So let's just say here, imagine that there's gonna be a dividend paid here. And, if the, and, and let's just say, if we're gonna use the second approach to, to, to do that, that means our first node is going to be 100 times U minus FD. Our second node is going to be 100 times D minus FD, right? It's just the reason why here is, is F, it's just saying, uh, we don't know how we're going to do it. Maybe it's, we're going to use the, the future value of dividends. Maybe it's, we're just going to use dividend. doesn't matter. It's just saying there's some function of, of D, but we just notice that it's going to be the same, right? We're going to be consistent of, of how we're treating it. And so, and then with that number, the next tree here is that it's gonna, it's gonna be U times that, isn't it, right? Just like that, it's gonna be U times that, we're gonna go up. So we'll have 100 times U minus FD times U, or it could go down, which is 100 times U minus FD times D. And for that, and for that one, that could be 100 times D minus FD times U for going up, or 100 times D minus FD times D for going down. Notice where I highlight that cell. In this case, if you compare those two numbers, I mean, two, two symbolic forms, can you say they're equal? One, one of them is 100 times U time, minus FD times D. The other one is 100 times D minus FD times U. So there's 100 times U, D is the same, right? Yeah. But that part is different. FD times D is different from FD times U. Right? I mean, yeah. you take, 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 I mean, if you're not sure, take a great, take a careful look of, of, of these numbers. You could say that those two numbers are no longer the same, isn't it? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, which means, Imagine we have more branches after that. So here we have four scenarios. How many scenarios would be the next one? Eight scenarios. How many of them would be the next one? 16 scenarios. So you can, you can see that now we actually overcomplicating the tree. Mm -hmm. And that, that's gonna go, go exponential. Because, because, mm -hmm. because, yeah, because they don't recombine. So which means instead of saying the one step, you get two scenarios, two steps, you get three, three steps, you get four scenarios. In this case, one step, we'll go two scenarios, two step, we get two power to two, three step, we get two power to three, three step, we get two power to four. Yeah. 
So that's just going to go exponential, right? By the time you go to 10 trees, that will be 11 scenarios, where the other one's going to be 1,024. Yeah. That becomes really, that becomes unmanageable, right? So which is why we, we chose to do this. So technically speaking, the, either of them is correct, right? Technically speaking, they're, they're all correct. It's because that's just how you would want to treat dividends. And you, so, which is why we decided to say, we treat the dividends by first looking at, by first, in, by first removing the dividend effect there to think about the growth uh, possibilities and then add back the dividends such that our trees still recombine after the dividend is paid. And recombine means that I don't have to deal with four scenarios, but we'll only all I have to do is three. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, I understand it. I might read it again later. Yeah, so the, 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 that's the website, frankliu.info, finet2204. Here, or if you want to use the discussion forum, I'm, I'm still going to be there to answer questions. It's going to be something someone asked about, that's like a month ago, about binomial model on deep paying stock. Yeah, that's the one I just checked. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I no do worries. know there was, there's the same questions on the discussion board. <laughs> that's okay. I mean, if, you know, uh, because the question, I mean, the title itself is not exactly clear. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Any other questions? No questions? Um, maybe I could, I could talk about Greeks if you guys can. Um, so, I mean, Greeks here um, only calculated sort of like in the black shows way. And every, every formula over here is derived by assuming we are following the black shows formula for European options. So that, which means that you know that all these Greeks uh, for European type of options. But I mean, that's, that should be sort of like um, the fundamental, right? And I don't think, I mean, if you can calculate it, that the, you, I mean, here, let's say if you want to calculate it, that's just going to be calculating ND1 for, for delta for core option. Put option will be just ND1 minus one. Um, but I guess the more important part of that here is to think about what does that mean when we're trying to do a hedging? Um, because in, in, because in practice, people worry about the delta of the options, given how leveraged the options are, right? Because options are very leveraged. Um, let me show you something. I probably have already explained before. Oops, not that one. Mm -hmm. I think I have a slide to show you why that's, that is risky. Yeah. So for example, if you take a look at this screen over here, this is actually from your week two or week three <clears throat> from futures contract, right? And you may, you may recall as a margin account. And this question, this example really is showing you 
how to deal with margins account, right? So for example, if you're putting straight to five zero dollars into the margin account, and when there's a four point drop in the futures price, you lose a hundred dollars because 25 times four, 25 dollars per point. And that means your margin account go down by 100 to 3150 and then you get a margin call, right? Um, that's an example that you saw before. But what's important for that table over here is that that also reveals why futures contract as well as options, they are leveraged. They're leveraged in the sense that because all you need to do is that you're putting straight to five zero in, like in this account to start a game. And then if it goes up by 100 or go down by 100, you're losing 100 out of two, straight 250. So here I calculate an extra two columns for returns. But that shows you that on some day where there is about $1,750 change in your, um, in your portfolio, and that translates to a 47% daily change, right? How often do you see a 47% change return in your, in your daily returns, in your portfolios? Rarely, rarely, right? So that tells you why options and futures contract here are leveraged. If you understand that, and that gives you better on better, better uh, position to think about why people worry about the change in the core option. Because what I'm trying to say over here is that, well, given it's a leverage, uh, it's such a leveraged product, if there's any change to the underlying stock price, my core option will either go up and down, my portfolio with core option will go up and down by a large amount. And, I want, I, and sometimes I want to hedge that. And by hedging, they, what they call is that they call a delta hedge, which means that they want to think about my portfolio is kind of immune to any small change in the underlying asset. And the portfolio they mean here is that the portfolio of holding either call or put options, right? So which means that in this case, that tells you why we're concerned about doing a delta hedge, right? I'm not sure how Andrew talked about this, but that, uh, hopefully that gave, that gave you a, uh, like uh, like like motivation to think about why people want to do a delta hedge, right? So, but in, but how exactly want to do delta hedge is quite straightforward. Is that to work out what is the delta of your current portfolio, and then to make it delta neutral, is to take the opposite position of that. So, for example, if your current portfolio, I, I don't want to talk about any particular numbers here, but I just want to think you think of intuitively. I just say if your portfolio has a delta of zero point seven. In order to make your portfolio delta neutral, you want to, you want to do a, an action where it gives you delta of minus 0 0.7. Such that 0 0.7 plus minus 0 0.7 give you zero. That's what we mean by delta uh, a hedge. Delta neutral is to change the delta to zero, right? So if your current portfolio has a delta of 0 0.7, you need to take something that has a delta of minus 0 0.7 such that overall, your data is zero. And if you understand that, then that just explains you exactly what you're doing over here. It's just, you're trying to neutralize your data, right? And it, the numbers may look kind of fancy, the equation might look fancy, but all they're trying to say here is what I just want to say that just that you want to neutralize it, so to change your data of your portfolio to zero. And you want and, and think about how exactly you want to do that. All right, I feel like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> I mean, that's what happens if you, if you teach online and everyone turn off the camera. All right, so if there are no further questions, it's been unfortunate. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was hoping that we can, we can get, get a few more questions. But if there are no further questions, um, um, 
yeah, I'll probably just wrap up this, this um, conversation. So remember, you can still have a chance to ask questions on the discussion forum. I will, uh, you know, I was still gonna, I wouldn't say monitor it, but I will try, to try my best to help you answer some of the questions mm -hmm. on the forums tonight or tomorrow morning, right? Um, yeah, and it's, yeah, well, it's great to have you over here. And um, see you uh, guys. Just one more question. Oh, cool. That means it's good. You know, uh, I, I want yeah, to have questions, but I don't know whether people are still there. I can't tell. Uh, just can't about tell. the exam, I just, uh, do we expect that the level of difficulty of the questions is going to be the same as the tutorial questions, or it'll be like a little bit harder? I can't answer that because I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I, honestly speaking, I don't know that, that the answer to that question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, Frank. Yeah, I still uh, want to ask about Delta Hadrian you just talked about. Uh, like, uh, you just uh, take example for like Delta neutral for 0 0.7. So the actions we take is like to uh, say, uh, seem the 0 0.7 like the cash flow. Because um, you said, if you want, I want to delta hedge, I need to change delta to zero. So I need to minus, uh, like sell, uh, no, sorry, get the minus 0 0.7 stocks. So I think, um, I get the answer is by 0 0.7 stocks. So it's like take action, like this is like cash flow or some. Let you know. me give you, let, let me give you, uh, let me just write it down, right? It's actually very, 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 very straightforward. Don't overcome, don't overly complicate it. I mean, I mean, like all the symbols regarding that is, is, is bit sort of. If, let's just say here, if you hold a call option, you can think about call option portfolio with delta 0 0.7, how, to uh, delta neutral, neutral, right? Just write it simply. In this case, I know I have 0 0.7 delta at the moment. I know that I wanted to such that equals to zero. That, that's my goal here, right? Yeah. Okay. So that means my focus now is looking at this. How do I actually do this? I mean, you don't need to worry about plus sign because I already bracketed. So how do I do, what gives me minus 0.7? Well, I, I look around. DS, DS equals to one. That tells you for one unit of underlying asset, the delta equals to one. Right? Yes. Plus one, because one is plus one. Because so that means for $1 change in the underlying asset, if I hold one asset, I will go up by $1, right? Yeah. So which means for 0 0.7 units of underlying asset, my delta equals to 0 0.7, isn't it? Yes. But my goal here is minus 0 0.7. So that means for 0 0.7 unit of short position, because short position is always the opposite in underlying asset. What's my delta? Minus 0 0.7, right? Because short position means the opposite. So it means if I go up $1 in the underlying asset, my long position go up by $1, my short position go down by one, right? Because it's the opposite, right? Yeah. So in this case, what do you do? Short 0 0.7 unit of underlying asset. And, and, and that's what you need to do from here. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. No worries. So, and then same thing goes when you when you do the gamma hedging. So delta and gamma hedging. It's, but the the whole way of, of of hedging neutral is think about I my action, the aim of my action is to neutralize it such that the end result is zero. And that means that here, if my current one delta is 0 0.7, then I need to take an action, which will give me minus 0 0.7, such that my overall delta is zero. The same thing with gamma, just switch, change the number. Let's say if my gamma here is 0 0.5, if I want to neutralize my, my gamma, that means I need to take an action that gives me a gamma of minus 0 0.5, right? And then, yes. and, and then you just think about what action will give you zero minus 0 0.5 gamma. And then, of course, the question will tell you, I mean, the question will be reasonably tell you, well, what is the delta of the option? Maybe they give you a number, 0 0.2, right? So that means, let's say if the gamma of the option is 0 0.2, that means I need to take 2.5 units of the option in order to achieve a gamma of 0 0.5, because 2.5 times 0 0.2 equals 2.5. And then to do to get minus 0 0.5, that means I need to short 2.5 units of whatever option is. So, but the whole whole idea, I mean, the reason why I don't put the numbers down here is that is they're all the same thing as, as this. Is that notice what, what 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 the delta is for the tool that you can use. The tool that you can use here is underlying asset. Right? That's the tool. And then work out the number. 0 0.7, and then work out a position, short, bing, 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 and then, and then you arrive at a conclusion. Yes. So like the, uh, we use the underlying assets to do our delta H. I, yes. Uh, so like the underlying assets, delta underlying assets is equal to one. It's, uh, Yes. And the gamma is equal to zero, so yes. we use these two things. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, your, uh, your, uh, the recommendation is here, right? It already tells you what you need to do, right? So you will take the underlying asset to make it delta neutral. But remember, when you're trying to neutralize your gamma, you need to take another option, and taking another option will help you remove your gamma, but then you will change delta. So what you do here is that you first of all make it gamma neutral by taking the option and then work out your, your new delta for, for, for when you combine with another option. And then you need to work out what, how many assets you need to do to make it neutral, uh, delta neutral again, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it kind of looks, looks complicated, but the strategy is really, really, really straightforward. I mean, it's, it's just think this is like a primary school math problem for many people, right? It's just like, how many do you have to do that to satisfy such condition? Uh, your goal here is to make them all zeros, right? And the so only, I, th yeah, you go. The series may be some confused, but the calculation is very easy. Like yeah, exactly, this. exactly. The it's calculation is just as easy as what I just performed, right? Yeah. Except that where for gamma neutral, you need to do gamma first, because by including another option, it changes your delta. So which means if you just focus on delta first, you have to do delta again, right? So that means that for gamma, delta and gamma neutral, you, you find out how you make your gamma to be zero first, and then you work out what your new delta is because you're taking extra options, and then work out how to delta neutralize that using the underlying asset. Okay, yeah. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> Do you mind repeating how we get the new delta with while using gamma, or is it the formula? I mean, it's I mean, there's no formula. I mean, uh, the formula here, the formula is provided here such that I mean, let me just because um, the reason why I'd be hesitant to go back to pal, pal, uh, my iPad is because once I go back to my iPad, you lose this information, right? So let's just take a look at this. Let's just say, just imagine. Don't worry about the question. Let me just let, let us just interpret these numbers together. So let's just say. If you have a, uh, you, you, let's say if your portfolio has, has a gamma of 0 0.5, if, if. Yeah. If you take option one, what, how would you, uh, how would you uh, perform a gamma neutral 
to your yeah. existing portfolio? Minus 0.5. So you would have short option one, right? Yeah. So by short option one, it gives you minus 0.5. Which gamma gamma neutralize your your current portfolio because your current portfolio is zero point five, right? Yep. Actually, what I could think of it easier is to to write these numbers up. Oh, let's just so you can let's say over here. Let's just say, uh, imagine we have a portfolio portfolio with Delta times delta equals to two, gamma equals to zero point five. Right? I'm just some easy number. I don't. I don't. I don't even want to verify that. So, but over here, if you if you in order to make it gamma neutral, to gamma neutralize it, we need to. We need to what? First of all, take one short option one such that 0 0.5 hours plus minus 0 0.5 which come from option one equals to zero right so so far are we happy yep okay and what is the new delta of our portfolio? Or in this case, originally we have two, right? Mm -hmm. Plus, in this case, we take a short position in the option one. Plus what? Minus 0 0.6. Oh, okay. that gives you 1.4. So, how to, uh, so now, how to delta neutralize it? So we need to 1.4 plus our new portfolio port plus something that's given me 1.4, which comes from short 1.4 underlying equals to zero. Easy. That's it. Oh, okay. I so I mean, yeah, so, it's, so, so the calculation here is actually extremely easy, right? I mean, how hard is that, the math over there? But the point here is that you need to know that options carries delta, gamma, and vega. So which means as, as soon as you're adding more options to your portfolio, that's going to change your overall delta, gamma, and vega. So which means that's why you want to gamma neutralize it first, work out a new delta. And then how and then neutral get data neutralize it with the underlying asset because the underlying asset has no gamma, right? So which means doing that is not is not gonna change your existing goal of gamma neutralization. Okay. Yep, got it. All right. Thank you. No worries. So is that in step two, our position has become the short. Uh, short position. So our delta in option one has become uh, sh um, like the sh in the position of short. So we need to minus zero point six. Yes, because that's what you're taking from, from your option one, from your from your section one, right? Because if you when you adding one short position one, short option yeah. one, not only it changes your gamma, but it also changes your delta, because that's what option one carries. Uh, so the portfolio is your image, but and when we back to our questions, we need to calculate the uh, portfolios we uh, get. Get. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if, if you look, if you look at it, the the, the, yeah. the number here is minus two thousand, minus five thousand. So which means just yeah. change these numbers. So here, gamma is mi minus five thousand. How do you neutralize it? Well, you take ten thousand of option one, right? Take oh. ten thousand of long position. I don't want to write this number because this number is too long. But if okay. you understand this scenario, it's, it's really yeah. not different from that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, that, it is really 12 o'clock. Um, and, but, but, you know, as I said before, if you guys have, have questions, please utilize the discussion forum. Um, I will check it tonight. 
um, and hopefully to get your questions answered. But otherwise, good luck to your exam, right? I, I understand it has been a rough semester. Uh, it's been unfortunate. I we, we do want to apologize from the business schools on business school's behalf, right? Uh, there's, you know, this you guys haven't got, uh, in my opinion, right? Uh, you haven't, haven't got as much attention as, as you could, should have gotten. Um, but um, yeah, we're trying to at least make everything your exams as, as smooth. And uh, hopefully you will have more enjoyable learning experience in the future. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Frank. No worries. Yeah, or I'll see you on Thank the forum, you. some of you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.